morning, everybody. It's a great privilege to be a speaker because you get to take this off. So I'm sorry I did a face reveal quite early in the day. Uh, and this way you'll be able to recognize me. And you get your Shaharadza coverings all over and I recognize that you, there is a certain advantages to it as well. Anyways, thank you very much for, for having me here. I know some of you from, from uh, Copenhagen and other places where this has been debated way before pandemic. So let's see how the whole uh, relationship of economics, which seems to be the dominant driving force of our news, agenda, politics, maybe even the movement of nations, relates in my reading with the, the world of art, which tends to be viewed as something nice, but not crucial. We have this uh, uh, saying, uh, inter armas silent muse, which, which of course uh, you with your Spanish will understand much more than me with my Slavic Czech. But they told me it means that in the war times, the muse are, uh, are silent because everybody's focusing on survival, food, and things that we've heard, such as paintings and, and dancing and things that don't really have any well, let me be brutal here. Any necessary meaning to human survival, as it seems from the front, tend to be suppressed. There is this beautiful story. I don't know whether it's true or not, because they have a tendency to attribute too many quotes to Winston Churchill. But one of those too many quotes of Winston Churchill's was uh, when they came to him with the war budget uh, during the Second World War, of course, cutting, cutting expendable uh, expenditures such as art uh, and, and education and culture and uh, he allegedly responded to this budget that focused all on war efforts and the whole economy even got cancelled because everything that was not directly related to the war efforts was deemed unnecessary to the survival of let's say liberal philosophy of, of, of free mankind so when they brought him the budget uh, that was a war budget without any culture uh, whatsoever, he famously looked at his advisors and he asked them, well, then what are we fighting for? So let me just go through um, uh, my understanding of the co-relationship between art and uh, 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 economics. If I do this, or if we do this, correctly and if we will really be able to look at the basic trends of development in this respect that if we do this correctly that could give us a little peek into the future of our our world which is of course very difficult to predict but in my research um, i have written a, uh, a book that starts with the epic of gilgamesh so um, greek antique is is is, is already young kids on the block uh, for me. And I've been trying to see the interplay of culture and economics. And now I'm working on the book where this should be expanded into the future. So let me start with a very practical question. How many of you own and use an alarm clock? Some of you are not very sure, yeah? Okay, why are you not sure? Huh? Maybe you use it, maybe it rings, but you don't use it. <laughs> nice. No, but maybe some of you were a little bit confused because what do I mean by an alarm clock, right? Well, of course I mean one and a half kilos. It ticks, it has a bell in it, there's a little hammer. It has to be recharged either manually or through batteries. How many of you have an alarm clock? Uh huh. So uh, you raised your hand before, didn't you? Don't, you, don't, you, you wake up with the birds. <laughs> so what, what, what's the confusion? What's, what's the confusion here? Ah, okay, perfect. Uh, sir, yes, please. Some of us, we, uh, we use uh, mobile telephones. Correct, correct. So, uh, but that's not an alarm clock. What is it? How would you call it? Something 
is in the alarm clock, the iron one that our grandmothers taught us to use. And then we have, can, I, can you actually show us where your alarm clock is? All right, where exactly? It's like maybe a second icon on your welcome screen. And your name, sir? Federico. Federico's alarm clock is two down, one left on the welcome screen. That's where Federico's alarm sort of kind of is. But I don't know, when I open my cell phone, of course, no alarm there. So what is it from the alarm that's survived the death of the alarm clock in its body, but something survived? And what is it? How would you call the, the thing that survived the death of The sound, perfect. We are here at the conference about symphonic orchestra, so sound is good. <laughs> what else? How else would we call it? The function, very good. What would Plato call it? I know this is far from Greece, but it's the same latitude. Maybe the idea of the alarm, yeah? What would Aristotle maybe say? The need, yeah, tell us. What would the French, any French people? Raison d'être, raison d'être, did I pronounce that properly? No, <laughs> but I tried. Uh, yeah, maybe raison d'être, maybe, maybe uh, an, uh, an uh, algorithm, maybe a function, or if Buddha or Moses or some of the religious leaders from the past, they would maybe say the spirit of the alarm is what Frederico is really talking about. So it's funny because the alarm is dead in its body, but his spirit marches. No autistic people today here. <laughs> On. All right, and this, in my view, this is what I'm going to be talking in the next 38 minutes about in a nutshell. This, I think, is happening right now to mankind. We are moving away from matter. Matter is becoming uh, a nostalgic, uh, how do you call this medication, alternative medicine, that you get a little bit of homeopathics. So, so in, in what I'm trying to be leading to is that the world of the real is becoming a homeopathicum. Homeopathicum is a, is, a, is a branch of an alternative medicine that gives you a little bit of the poison. What used to kill us in the past, physical work, for example, that was a big killer, is now in a homeopathized form very healthy. You do this in gyms. We try to pretend work but it's not really work anymore. We don't do this to live. We don't do this eight hours a day. We just do a little bit. Or a good example is, is gardening. I don't know how much you do it here in the beautiful city, by the way, of Madrid, and your food is amazing. I have this ratio of you know, good versus bad restaurants. I mean, there are good restaurants in every city, but there's a ratio between the good ones and the bad ones. And, you know, it's 50-50. You're lucky if you get one here. Well, we seem to have had a 100% success ratio here in, in Madrid. So however you do it, I don't know, but we in Czech Republic, we have this hobby called gardening. So people have this like weekend hobby, two, three hours a week. They like to put their fingers in the mud. Feels good, obviously, to them. And that's healthy, that's good. But we no longer actually do agriculture. In Denmark, which is a good example because Danes Dan Danish agriculture is famous till this very day, but it only makes up of about 1.2% of GDP. In 1860, it was 82% of GDP. In other words, if I, sub if I make this a little bit uh, simplified, 82% of all our energy had to be directed towards food. 
Today, everything we saw yesterday in the tapas of Madrid, champagne, beer, caviar, lobster, you name it, is 1% of our energy. The rest of that we can use for useless things, such as cars, uh, computers, and other stuff. So we have homeopathized. Um, uh, there is, of course, a nice joke about homeopathy. Do you know how, uh, how, how we call alternative medicine that has been proven to work? Medicine. <laughs> but let's hope that, uh, that this, this, this thing may serve as a good parable of what's really happening to us in the world. And my thesis is, again, that we are in the middle of leaving it. I think the change that we are undergoing, ladies and gentlemen, right now is a tectonic change, not something that began during our lifetimes, but it has been um, brought to a, a tectonic shift. What we are witnessing today, we as mankind, we saw from the beginning of our history when our consciousness woke up. But the example of the alarm clock, we've always had alarm clocks. We've had uh, crowds before, right? yeah? in the morning when we lived in the city, the crowds would wake us up. And then we no longer use that. We, ha we, we put that into mechanical watches because it was important to wake exactly at 10 o'clock. Um, and today, we've moved that into this digital form of an alarm clock. Now, which one is better is the old, nice, good-looking, little bit nostalgic, very unpractical, especially for traveling, alarm clock more of an alarm clock? Or is this more alarm? What is more alarmy? Uh, well, I don't know. This one seems to be more popular. It, for, for starters, it's for free. As an economist, I have to appreciate that. This doesn't really cost you nothing. It's also ecologically quite friendly because it doesn't require any dedicated material. Of course, it needs some sort of a body but the body is non-dedicated. It's, it's body where um, your books also sleep. It's the same dimension where your movies, your family photos are. You know, sometimes I just like to think about all the fantasy books that we've read when we were young and how many things have actually materialized today without us even saying thank you to anybody. For example, Alice in Wonderland, she had this bag in which she could put anything and the bag wouldn't bulge up, nor, it would be, nor would it be heavier. And I always, of course, everybody wants to have a bag like that without realizing that we all do. It doesn't matter if you have one book or 1,000 books, if you have one contact or 3,000 contacts in it. We've really uh, um, achieved situations that uh, have been dreamed about in the past, especially in the world of art especially in the world of fantasy. Uh, give, me, give me something that we haven't actually materialized from the writings of, uh, of our fantasy writers in the past. We flew here on Monday and always people ask me, so where have you been? And I said, I've been in 10 kilometers. And I ate peanuts. And I had these shoes and these trousers. And it doesn't really matter where I came from, whether it's Prague or, or, or Zurich or Frankfurt, but I have been higher than Annapurna. And I was complaining about the leg room. No dragons of past, and I checked this thoroughly, even in the Lord of the Rings, they never flew up to 10 kilometers. They would probably die because of the lack of, oxygen, uh, lack of air. Uh, and, 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 and the different density. We can now dive deeper than the fish of old because we have tapped into something that no other animal has tapped in, and that is the miracle of art efficiality. The word art is closely related to the word artificial. And when I want to dive as a diver, I can do it, I can really breathe underwater for, for almost an hour if I dress myself into self-containing underwater breathing apparatus, which is what SCUBA, if you ever wondered, that's what SCUBA stands for, self-containing underwater breathing apparatus. If I dress myself into a plane, 
I can fly into 10 kilometers in these shoes. So we are living in the world that has transcended, in a way, the world of the biggest fantasies of the artist imagination. Take telepathy, for example. Telepathy is a good example. We used to train that with a very stringent and ascetic diet after Many years of spiritual exercises, some people allegedly can send a triangle to another person through a wall, which is a great success, of course, not to be ridiculed in any way. But we've mastered telepathy in a way that I can speak to my Chinese friend at distance with no wires, and I can tell him more, again, than just a triangle. So in the beginning, uh, we, as mankind, lived in a state of an animal. You can also, I do this, you can also imagine how we had this when we were small children. We just did, our consciousness didn't click yet. And let's just call her a lady because I want to be uh, gender, um, uh, gender fair. It, it could have been a lady, I think it was a lady. 200 million years ago, she was walking on her four, and suddenly she saw something that wasn't. She saw a tool in a stone. In Jungian psychoanalysis and in, uh, uh, in, uh, yeah, in the historian's um, uh, reading, there are four basic archetypes of a hero, and I don't want to go through all of them, but the first one is the archetype of a trickster. First comes trickster, then comes the bearer of culture, then is the third archetype is the muscle man, the spider man, he man, uh, superman, wonder woman, cat woman, all these people that don't have moral dilemmas but they solve issues with a fist. Captain America is a good example. That's a very late state of a hero. And then the final stage of a hero is a twin as an entity that fights within itself. I think the, uh, the movie um, Fight Club is a very good example of that at the end of the day. Spoiler alert, if there's anybody who hasn't seen the movie, it's, uh, it's the same guy actually fighting himself, um, having a, some sort of a schizophrenic um, personality. This order is actually quite funny. I can't see if you're smiling or frowning. So I'll just I'll just assume away that you're smiling, all of you, even those who are frowning. <laughs> That's an assumption. As an economist, you know how we treat life. We assume things away. So I'll do that trick this time, this time again, uh, because, it, 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 because I can. So anyway, so she's walking, crawling down the, the, the forest, and suddenly she picks up a stone. And that stone... Um, I always feel how that stone must have felt. Because in certain philosophies, there, the, the, certain philosophers propose that, you know, in this horror movie reading, that the spirit, uh, spirit possesses a man. If you think of the movie Exorcist, again, there, there's this young lady, and an evil satanic spirit possesses her and makes her say things that she wouldn't say and makes her do things that she wouldn't do, the stone must have felt the same way. And the philosophers come to this conclusion that we are the ghost. We human beings are that spirit that possessed an animal and made him do things that the animal would never do. For example, to dress. Which is funny, I always think, you know, when, when they, they, they say that when, we, when human beings get drunk, we start behaving like animals. I wonder how it would be for animals to get drunk, you know, if like monkeys get drunk and then one of them says, hey, let's put on some clothes and let's do a lecture, you know, <laughs> and let's wear a tie. <clears throat> uh, and, 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 and so this lady, anyway, so she, she found a stone and suddenly she discovered that if she dresses herself in the stone, if she possesses the stone, I mean, the stone was having a good day lying there and suddenly some external spirit force started hacking him against... Uh, a bear or against a tree, and that lady discovered, hey, with this in my hand, I become more me than just me. 
Consequently, we started feeling very natural in a non-natural environment. We feel more ourselves when we're really not ourselves, when we actually can dress ourselves with an instrument, for example. I dress myself in the violin, and I say things that I wouldn't be able to say with my mouth or with my finger or drum. Any instrument is a good example of that. I dress myself into it, and I become more me when I have 20 drums around me and two sticks. Not useful for eating, and other things, but I become more human. This may be a more of an alarm than the alarm that our grandmother had, because it, yeah, it, I already said the two advantages. It also can wake you up to your favorite song. So if you do have a favorite song that you want to hate in two weeks, set it as your alarm clock. It also watches your, your low and high sleeping cycles. So it's better than your mother, in a way. So my hypothesis. Number two is that the, uh, the digital form, the bodiless uh, alarm, is more of an alarm than the material mechanical clockwork that we used to do. And the clockwork, the, oh, there is still a room for that clock clockwork, and it becomes beautifully apparent because what has the alarm, I, I painted a little alarm clock here, it will stay with us forever as a, brackets, religious icon. These things are called icons, right? So your alarm icon has the likeness, the image of alarm, but that's, that's the only thing that will remain from the material alarm clock. So this lady suddenly has this, and she discovered that this is better at, at cutting down the tree than her nails or her knees or maybe her teeth. And she discovered that, hey, I saw in that stone something that wasn't, and I possessed it. I possessed matter. My spirit suddenly no longer controls just my fingers but it controls an extension that isn't naturally endowed to us from the natural state of being. We, ladies and gentlemen, we started moving into artificial worlds because it was so advantageous for us to do so. Even here, we live, we are here in an artificial setting. I mean, it's a little bit windy outside, but it's not windy here. It's uh, cold outside, it's not cold here. In fact, in this room, we'll have the same temperature throughout the whole year, in scorching heat and also in cold summers, if, uh, cold summers, cold winters, if you ever have that here. Not recommended. So we don't like that. We like this temperature, so we create around us the building and heating and also our dressing sometimes. I usually do this in the later hours of the day, but this is warm enough here for us all to sit here naked. But would we feel more ourselves if we sat here naked? I only see your face. I only see this part of your face, and I see your hands. The rest of it is covered, and the same goes for here. Why are we dressed? Is it because we're cold? No, it's a psychological thing. We wouldn't feel ourselves if we were ourselves. We feel much better in the skin of Fernando de Tarecher. I, I got this in Madrid yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, so thanks to this guy's skin or whatever, I feel better in the skin of a cow or a pig and, and rather than actually using my own skin as skin. So. Um, let's, 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 let's draw something that could be useful in concluding from this. So ever since this lady picked up the stone, she started the process of mankind becoming more mankind by possessing things that were not naturally ours. And she saw a world that she could use. And she imagined a world, a crazy world, in which not the lion 
is eating us, but a world in which we are eating the lion, which was, of course, crazy, and that's why the psychoanalysts came up with the name Trickster, because she realized two things. She realized the reality can be changed into our image, and she had an art, she was the first artist in the world because she imagined a non-existing world according to which she changed the world of the real. And the second thing she realized is I can never stand with my nails and with my teeth against a tiger. I have to trick him by digging a hole as a trick or by using sticks as a trick or by coordinating the hunt somehow, which other animals can do as well. And we have begun the journey to the wealth of the nations all the way till us sitting here. And this, I think, if we, if we are right here, that the wealth of nation depends on the ability to imagine artificial, artificial worlds, then that could mean huge implications for the future. And that would also mean that uh, not Chesterton, um, uh, uh, Churchill was right. So first starts the world of mythology. The world of mythology imagined two worlds, the world of angels and demons and ghosts and, 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 and gods and divinities and, and the world of real. Then came more structured religion, and religion presupposes the existence of two worlds, angels, hell, heaven, gods, devils, and then there is the world of us. But you can also see this in art, in fact, when you are, for example, in a theater or at, uh, at, an, at, at a concert. It's really, in a way, a collective out-of-body meditation. George Lucas paid a lot of money to create one and a half hours of collective meditation, maybe even hypnosis. I don't know, but you know, of course. And nobody here believes in the existence of lightsabers and different species. But for two hours, we kind of do. It's funny, the more real, this is something that Czech philosopher Patochka came up with, the more d deserted the world of real becomes, the more we will be able to identify with a non-existing world. Let me, put this in, let me put this in practical terms. I can only watch a movie where the heroes are hungry, running away, cold, and their life is threatened, which is usually what happens in movies movies that I watch, <laughs> um, exactly in a situation when you yourself are not hungry, not cold, and your life is not threatened. So we live our lives through the prism of this artificiality. So when you are in a theater and there is Romeo and Juliet, for example, uh, if the trick is well done, then you sort of forget that you're John uh, in the second row of the second, uh, second chair in the second row, and you really are there with Romeo and Julia, hoping they won't die, even though you know very well they never even lived. And you know very well how it's going to end. But still, you cry or you laugh. Because, and you also, these actors in Greek cinema, they were called hypocrites. Not in a bad connotation, but yeah, she doesn't really love him. She's an actor that's pretending to love him. And she's also pretending to be dying. And he's doing the same thing. After the play is over, they get up and, and we clap. The magic is over. Let me relate this to the world of the economy so that we get this a little bit more practical. For example, when we play, when we play uh, Monopoly, this game, uh, of course, we all know that the paper money doesn't have any value, right? But during the game itself, it has huge value. Children cry when they lose this paper money. Adults cheat to get a little bit of this paper money from their children. 
And the moment the game is over, the magic is dispelled, and we suddenly see, oh, those are just papers. This is what money is. So the first, I claim, the first explanatory trend between the wealth of uh, behind the wealth of nations is the ability to think in an abstract way. Money is extremely useful exactly because it doesn't exist. Because it doesn't exist, it can travel at the speed of light. I can call Australia and say, okay, start building the mall. I'll send the money tomorrow and they'll start building the mall if they trust me. And not only can money travel at the speed of light, because you know that the only thing that can travel at the speed of light is something that doesn't have any mass, for example, photons. Anything that has mass is impossible to, well, yeah, it's almost impossible to accelerate it to the speed of light in vacuum. But money can travel with the speed of light because they are, in fact, not on the periodic table of things. Um, I have always a hard time explaining this to students. Like, it's uh, elves are more real than money or witches, or, or, or whatever. Why? Well, because hypothetically, maybe on some other planets or in deep Amazonian forests, maybe elves really exist. Maybe. I don't think so, but maybe. Money doesn't. Not even on, it wasn't there in the Big Bang. It's not made of atoms. It's not made of baryonic matter. It doesn't exist just like law doesn't exist, just like democracy doesn't in exist, just like the painting of a still life, dead nature, it's in Spanish, I never got that, the dead nature. Uh, the picture of a vase is depicting the soul of the vase, but you cannot put a flower into a picture of a vase. This is not a pipe. You cannot smoke a pipe that's, that's painted on. You can see this, if I want to go, I said I'm going to go a little bit more practical, and I did, but not much. In our lifetimes, just observe how many things have left the real world and entered the world of non-real. Maps, uh, books, movies, music. How many things we have seen in our lifetime disappear and become spiritual? I don't know. I don't have a better word. And today, as we have gone up in abstractization, we today read abstractization as a digitalization. Digitalization, for me, is the most modern and maybe also most useful, even though there I'm not sure, form of a myth. It doesn't really exist. Nothing you see here exists. It's just a symbol. Once I was, I had high fever, and when I have high fever, I hallucinate. So there's always something for me to look for. And, and I was at home, this was seven years ago, and I had really high fever, and I was looking in my library, in my real library, I was looking for a book that I needed to find. And I couldn't find it. And because I had this fever, I thought, oh my god, maybe I'll Google it where it is. And then I realized, no, Google can only <laughs> help you find things that don't exist. The book that actually really exists, Google's useless. But how many times um, do we need to find that? Because I could find the book in the digital form. So we are moving into this world, and now let me give a practical example of something that we could see during our lifetimes. When we were young, we boys wanted to work, because I'm a little bit of a nerd, you can tell. That's why I'm having these fun trousers, so that my nerdiness wouldn't be revealed. I'm nerd from waist up. Um, I wanted to work. The co company that was cool, that was the titan, that was the shifter of the paradigm, was IBM. They made very high value added matter. I mean, if you took a computer from IBM and threw it into a fire, you would get a stone. This stone, by the way, is the descendant of that stone that that predecessor of ours touched 200, year, 200 million years ago. 
It has been tortured, it has been burned, it has been hit, it has been stretched, it has been, I mean, my God, these things were never even supposed to see the, the light of the day. We took them from the depths of the ground like dwarves. We dug deep until we found everything that we needed. But, whoa! But we've tortured the stone with our soul long enough so that we can play Tetris on it. And it also sounds like your mother when you dial her up. And when you do dial her up, I always remind my friends that you're not talking to your mother, you're talking to this, which is what you're doing, because your mother isn't there. That's why you're calling her. And this is, this is I think, the pinnacle of, of economy. What economy does, or modern society, they separate the son from the mother, but also create a gap, uh, also create a bridge to, to bridge that gap. So back in the day, I didn't need anybody to talk to my mother because we all lived together in villages 200 years ago, maybe even 100 years ago. If, if you even gave people cell phones, they were like, I don't, what do I do with this? Except for maybe warlords, cell phones would be not useful because we had the immediate experience of the other person. IBM makes things that our spirit possesses the neural links so that it can answer your mother's calling of her son. So IBM molded matter to the likeness, to our image, just like God did with us in the book of Genesis. In the image of us, we have molded the stone. And that's what IBM did. All right, IBM's all but dead. And if they do anything, which they do, it's not matter anymore. But the second firm that came after that was called Microsoft. Still very powerful for the day, but not as much as in the 80s and in the 90s. Microsoft, those were the that was the second titan that a little bit replaced, well, replaced, added on IBM because they create, as the name suggests, Microsoft, something that's not tangible. They create spirits, they create algorithms, they create managerial systems, they create uh, lo logical, um, uh, non-existing logical structures like management of information, like if I, yeah. So that was, that was Microsoft and their key product was called Windows, which I think is a very nice name to read symbolically, and I will, and I will do that uh, soon. And after Microsoft came Google and Facebook, and, but let's focus on, on Google. Google doesn't even, even do these programs anymore. So you can see that within our lifetime, We've moved, the economy, or the most successful and the biggest companies, moved from alternating matter, IBM, to a much higher level of abstractness, Microsoft, to an even higher level of abstractness, which is Google. Try to explain to somebody from Middle Ages what Google does. My reading of this is that we are one of the last generations that is still spending majority of their time, let's just say, for the lack of a better word, under the sun. Our children who have already been born into the digital realm consider this world, this world, the world of Boomers. Okay, how many of you know what a boomer means? You all have children. <laughs> and IRL, do you know what IRL means? In real life, yeah. <laughs> so when a child is playing their games and mother and father come and drag him from this virtual new republic of internet, into the real in order to eat a breakfast, they go into this old style world of IRL. I also think it stands for irrelevant. 
And they eat their breakfast, they brush their teeth, they go to school, but the center of gravity, if I may say so, I am afraid, is already on this new, in this new world. So what comes after? Well, I think uh, windows, what's a window? Well, window is something we don't have many when there's a window sort of up there. So window allows you to be in two dimensions at the same time. Okay, we are inside, but we also sort of kind of see the outside. Maybe we see trees or people walking by, sun is setting. Um, so I'm both inside and outside. And that's what windows did. Uh, everywhere here is reality, and here is Lord of the Rings, or here is China. So, so uh, or, or snapshots from medieval battleships. So we, my thesis is that we've always constructed these second worlds. We've always wanted to leave this world. I mean, it is in the heritage of Buddhism. It is in the heritage of Christianity. It is in the heritage of all religions, even philosophies that we never really felt good in our bodies, in this, in flesh. Because it's animalistic, it sweats, it has these aggressive desires. It's really something that we should transcend. This is also, I think, why we dress, so, you know, to cover the fact that we're actually a reproductory, uh, um, in, 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 well, I think we are a biological representation of a, of a, of, of a recursive reproductory system of language. That's my uh, religion, that language speaks through us rather than the, the other way around. But the next stage, uh, and this, I think, is, is a prophecy that might turn out as well as not. But I think the next stage is something that I, that uh, it will no longer be windows, but that it will, I name it according to my favorite band from 60s and 70s, um, The Doors. That, I think, will be the next stage. I demonstrate this sometimes on my lectures. I'm not going to do it to you today because I like it too much. But normally I, what I do is, I, okay, so that's a window. And there here, you see, that's the door. And let me show you what a door does. Maybe I should do it. Well, just imagine me walking to the door and actually leaving this place. That's what door does. Window allows you to really be undecisive whether you stay home or go out. Door, if you use a window, if you use a door, you are no longer here. So, to sum up, my first hypothesis is that we have been leaving the world of the real into the world of the abstract, into the world of the art, official, into the world of mythology, be it digital mythology or Babylonian mythology or Christian mythology. And we are now making this religious dream technically possible through the virtual reality. Second trend that I don't want to spend much time on is uh, being able to communicate this ideology to the vast amount of geographical landscape, in our case, the planet. This is something that um, We've documented very well in the history of economics, we call it specialization. But in order to specialize, there has to be many of us. And in order to specialize, we also need to trust each other. For, for, because what I can do is I can lecture and I can write books, that's pretty much it. The company dresses, I mean, the, the society dresses me, feeds me, gives me things to play with, flies me over without me being able to fly a, a, a jet like that. Or, as an exchange of my lectures and my writing skills and maybe teaching your children about, uh, about economics. There needs to be many. Switzerland is a very rich country, but they cannot produce a car because there's simply not enough of them to specialize on such things. Romania, on the other hand, not as, expensive, not as rich as Switzerland, can produce a car because there's simply enough of them to specialize, to, to, to leave half a million, well, hundreds of thousands of people to do something as unnecessary as a car is. And the ability to have the same ideology, to have, for example, believe in the dollar, this is something that Harari says really nicely, that the biggest storytellers are not George Lucas or, uh, what's her name, uh, the Harry Potter, um, Rolling, those are not your storytellers. Your storytellers are central bankers. 
because they somehow tell a story about the dollar, which doesn't exist, which everybody believes in. This was something that I, that I, um, that I'm, I think I'm running out of time slowly. Is anybody keeping it? Can somebody shoot me in five, ten, ten minutes? Cool. Um, this other trend is planetization. So the first is the ability to believe in abstract, unbelievable, even ridiculous things. This is, I think, what happened to us when we invented language. This was a great invention in the beginning of our thinking. We've invented language. And once we, this was a high-tech invention back in the day. And once we have it, some predecessors of us started playing with words and they thought, hey, like with Frisbee, Let's just see how far we can throw it. What's the use of it? I don't know. It's fun. Elon Musk threw one all the way to the orbit. Why? Because we just like to throw things and see how far they land. This one I can do on an orbit? Yeah, let's do that. They started doing that with language. My, my, my hypothesis is they said, OK, let's try and make a yellow dragon that spits fire and eats virgins and lives in that mountain and can only be appeased by us dancing on the left leg while wearing yellow socks and doing hoopa doopa doo. And you could do this, not in reality, of course, but in language, yes. You paint an artificial representation of a bull and suddenly you can you can play with it. You can make plans. You can say, OK, this bull. You can't control a real bull. But you can control an image of a bull. So this world, which we have visited before in religious trance or on drugs, because the, the name that Jimmy Morrison gave to his band, The Doors, came because he was reading a book by Aldous Huxley the Doors of Perception, where Aldous Huxley, the same guy who wrote The Brave New World, was talking about his experimentations with psychedelics. Or when you're actually watching Romeo and Juliet, or when you're reading a book about something, and if the book is good, you for a little second, you know this feeling. This is, I think, why we read books. You forget that you're Thomas Sedlicek in Prague with two legs and, and a nose. But you are for a little while. You're Huckleberry Finn, and you are Tom Sire playing with each other and giving each other slightly racist comments. You forget you have an out-of-body without the esoterics, but you do have an out-of-body experience when you're listening to music for one and a half hour. What is music else? My son, for example, who's very technical, he's like, I don't like music. I was like, why? No, because some other people's mood influences me. And I don't want that. I said, well, but, you, but a building hypnotizes you as well. You, I mean, here, I am hypnotized slightly differently. And I would say better, thank you for this level of very nice uh, hypnosis, than if we were somewhere in a hotel in the cellar where the sun don't shine, with white walls. And even though that hotel, or yeah, that hotel, all that block of flats was not built with the intention to hypnotize people, it does do that. But my son said, yeah, well, but you know, doesn't it also happen to you, dad, that you know, sometimes you get this music stuck in your head that you don't like? And you hear a stupid pop song in the morning, in the radio, and then you have it in your head the whole day, and it does influence your mood, and you can't get it out. And he was like, that was the only reason <laughs> what I'd be willing to listen to another piece of music just to get the old one <laughs> out. But anyway, that's my son, rather um, a technical, technical character. So that's the path of the digital wealth. There are economists who, for example, John Maynard Keynes, the biggest economist of the last century, who wrote about this. And he called it the grand possibilities, uh, sorry, the economic possibilities for our grandchildren, if I may, Recommend one piece of economic literature for you to read. I'd recommend you Keynes's Economic Possibilities for our grandchildren because it was a 20-minute speech. It's about eight pages, and it's really nice. In it, he says, if I see the recent development of the economy, we will come soon, not now, not your children, but maybe your grandchildren. He was writing this in 30s. <clears throat> in about 100 years from now, which is, by the way, coming up in nine years, 
hundred years from this prophecy, we will be so affluent, we will no longer follow the old Adam. Keynes here is using very strong religious language. A new man and woman will be born and we will no longer become the objects of the economic unorchestrated orchestrator. The economy cannot be orchestrated. Laissez faire, laissez passer. The economy will orchestrate us. The economy will give us values according to cost benefit analysis. How lucky we are that art actually turns out to be economically beneficial. I mean, we have many models in which we see that a more cultured country is also a wealthier country. I call this the kindness of nature. For some reason, education goes hand in hand with wealth. For some reason, liberty goes hand in hand with wealth. For some reason, did I say education? Education, arts, all these, or being fair, corrupt nations end up poor nations, generally. Couple personalities or persons will get rich, but the rest of the country will be poor. Why is this? This is really a kindness of nature. We had this in my country 30 years ago, 31 years ago, 1989, when we were revolting against the communist regime. We had a choice that was a really easy choice. It wasn't really a choice. Do you want totalitarian and poor society or free and rich? Pick one. Poor and totalitarian, rich and free. That was not really <laughs> much of a choice. Do you want chocolate or vanilla or both? Well, it would have been a true dilemma if we had to choose rich and totalitarian and free but poor. But this, luckily, because of the kindness of nature, we didn't have to do. I would rather opt out for the poor and free, but I'm not sure about the rest of my countrymen. So I'm happy that this dilemma really wasn't there. But what if, and I'm saying this is not the case, but what if we discovered that art actually slows down economic progress? I mean, intuitively speaking, you could argue for it. Again, this, this is a, a, a case study. It's just a thought example. Just, you know, all the time wasted in galleries. What is that good for? Why not produce bullets or glasses or something that's actually useful? And not to mention all the time that the artists spend painting. Same for corruption. We have studies in which we can clearly show that a country which is less corrupt is better off in GDP growth in long term and in short term than a corrupt country. We can show this, document this. That means let's try and get rid of corruption because it's an economically beneficial. But what if, what if we had studies that showed the opposite? We don't, but what if? Would that mean that and again, intuitively, you know, in the, in the 90s in my country, it was like, well, you know, the more you bribe, the faster you get things done. So bribing is economically advantageous. And, you know, it also, you know, I mean, you could argue, I would argue against you, but you could argue in that it's not unimaginary that this result would be as a result of a study. Would we then advocate corruption? Would we then become a society of orcs? Whose GDP growth, by the way, I've estimated to 23% annually. They were going, you know, the orcs from the uh, Lord of the Rings. They were going through industrialization, heavy deforestation, and a preparation for war. Those are things that really help <laughs> your GDP growth. Will we become a society of orcs if it's helping our GDP growth? Or will we become a society of elves that had no GDP growth for, 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 for generations because they never made anything new? They just inherited the old swords and the old armor and you know, GDP-wise speaking, Mordor or, uh, or Isengard would be a much interesting place, a much more interesting place to invest in. But of course, our nature immediately says no. So if you have two countries 
that are completely the same. One of them, country A, has the same laws like country B, but in country A you have culture of market, culture of democracy. And in the other, same laws, but no culture at all, that country will end up sooner or later with the orcs, uh, while the first country will end uh, blessed. So the second trend is the ability to communicate this all across. And uh, those are the final words with which I want to leave you. Uh, when Donald Trump was running for the American president, he was, he was saying that he wants the America to be great again. And I was always wondering, hey, that's, that's funny because last time I checked, there's no country called America. It's a continent. And I was thinking, hey, finally, we have some really good visionary leaders who are thinking about the future of the whole continent, including Mexico, including Venezuela, including Argentina, including Canada. And I thought, hey, there, this guy made a Freudian slip. Freudian slip is when you say the truth without wanting to say it. The only way how to make United States of America, which is, I suppose, what he wanted to say, great again, is to make America as a continent great again. So I hope for us, <clears throat> one day there'll come a leader who will ask for your votes and the votes of your children with the words, I hope to make the world great for the first time. I wish you a wonderful conference. Thank you.